Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And today I want to look at an aspect of Nazism uh, and the figure within um, the inner workings of the Nazi regime, at least during the, the 1930s, uh, that gets to some extent overlooked, and that is the Treasury Minister Yalmar Schacht, Dr. Yalmar Schacht, who was on the 16th of March 1933 appointed to the presidency of the uh, Reichsbank by Adolf Hitler. Now, as we've explored before, Hitler has very little understanding of economics and practically little interest in it. For him, economics was a simple matter of racial conquest, the way that you grow your economy is by plundering the economies of uh, lesser peoples. Um, Hitler's main goal uh, when he took office um, in uh, January 1933 was the March election. This, uh, on this, everything hung. Economic policy um, was uh, spoken about in broad generalizations. Um, he made a, a kind of a broad commitment. Uh, in his speech, the appeal to the nation to solve unemployment and the poverty of the uh, kind of agrarian class. Um, he didn't make any uh, detailed uh, specific proposals like uh, a- a- any good um, fascist populist figure who was seeking to uh, speak to anyone who would listen. Um, he had a vague understanding that in order to uh, allot resources to one portion of society, you need to drain them away from another. Uh, and so uh, going into specifics uh, in terms of economic policy pledges was not what he, he wished to do. On the 8th of February, Hitler told his cabinet they should avoid all detailed statements concerning the economic programme of the government. So Hitler was hoping to have the the widest possible appeal um, to secure um, the the largest section of the population and didn't want to be unpopular in any way. Now, in Hitler's agenda to um, prepare Germany for war, he needed the broadest mandate possible to transform society to create this sort of uh, people's community, the Volksgemeinschaft, and he needed to be able to um, have as broad a mandate possible and to introduce the kind of extreme measures that he wanted to see, particularly um, the um, cutting away of what was referred to as social ballast, the those kind of unproductive individuals, be they the people with disabilities or those who are asocial, uh, this is even before he's considering uh, racial policy uh, against the Jews. So, as you can imagine, the um, complex uh, uh, complexities of fiscal and monetary policy, Hitler is not engaging with uh, at all. So when on the 16th of March, um, the presidency of the Reichsbank is handed to Yalmar Schacht, it's a quite a momentous um, decision for a number for a number of reasons. His previous, his predecessor, Schacht's predecessor, had been um, Hans Luther, who had been a highly conservative figure, who had uh, restricted the um, Weimar governments um, from spending. So he had not been very keen on work creation programs. He had not been very keen on notionally Keynesian ideas because he thought they were inflationary and indeed they they generally tend to be. If you pump money into an economy without include sort of growing the productive base of the economy, you have um, lots and lots of money chasing the same amount of resources and therefore you have um, bidding for those resources and prices begin to outstrip wages. However, um, the uh, figure of Luther, who was um, disposed of and was replaced by Schacht, um, who had a significant, who had had a significant part to play in the economic history of the the Weimar Republic. Um, in the nineteen twenties, Schacht had uh, been in charge of the uh, the Young Plan and had been part of the the nationalist opposition to the Republic. So uh, in 1931, he had created links with Hitler 
and they continued to support Hitler even when um, it looked as if Hitler's time in the wilderness might be indefinite. Schacht himself wasn't in the Nazi party uh, at this point. He had, the Nazi party had all sorts of fellow travellers on the right, people who perhaps didn't subscribe necessarily to the virulent anti-Semitism of the Nazis, but had their own bigotries and prejudices and had kind of degrees of, uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, Schacht himself, his skill was that he was able to uh, create financial instruments to make uh, the the kind of the economic impossible seem uh, possible. Um, sort of the kind of the, the financial smoke and mirrors that have become an increasing feature of, of 20th century economic history. Um, and he was able now to bring these skills to Nazism, to the, the Nazi regime, uh, and try to introduce the sorts of measures that he thought would stabilise Germany. And these measures, as we'll see, perhaps, uh, hopefully in this podcast, but certainly in, in subsequent podcasts on Yalmar Schacht, these measures would eventually actually bring him into conflict with Hitler. When Schacht began to develop um, deficit financing, so creating debt in order to uh, pay for uh, essential infrastructure or rearmament, um, these were practices that um, Schacht's predecessors had been very, very anxious about and were determined to avoid the hyperinflation of 1923 had been um, a kind of a, a sanitary lesson to the Weimar Republic. One of the most uh, significant uh, innovations was the creation of the, the MIFO bill. Um, and the method worked something like this. The, the MIFO bill was a, a device for creating, um, creating money, um, creating uh, cash flow in order to pay for rearmament. Um, the, in uh, Noakes and Pridham's uh, Nazism, a documentary reader, um, they quote the uh, financier, uh, the uh, Emil Puhl, who was the post-war director of the Reich Bank, and when he explained MIFO bills. Emil Puhl said, Dr. Schacht, president of the Reich Bank, after considering various techniques of financing, proposed the use of the MIFO bill to produce, provide a substantial portion of the funds needed for the rearmament programme. This method has had as one of its primary advantages the fact that secrecy would be possible during the first years of the rearmament programme, and the figures indicating the extent of rearmament would have become public through the use of other methods, and they could be kept secret through the use of MIFO bills. MIFO bills, abbreviated for MIFO Veschel, were drawn uh, by the armament contractor and then accepted by uh, the Metallurgischen Gesellschaft, which uh, was abbreviated to MIFO. These bills ran for six months, with extensions running for three months each consecutively. The total life of the bills varied, and in some instances exceeded for four years. The Reichsbank could discount the original bill any time within its last three months. The co-endorser and drawer did not have to accept any liability. This provision results from the guarantee of the bill by the Reich. The MIFO bills were used exclusively for financing rearmament, and when in March 1938 a new finance programme discontinuing uh, the use of MIFO bills was announced by Dr Schacht, there was a total volume outstanding of 12 billion marks of MIFO bills, which had been issued to the finance re- to finance rearmament. One of the primary reasons for discontinuing financing rearmament with MIFO bills was that by the spring of 1938 it was no longer considered necessary to keep the progress of German rearmament secret. The rearmament boom had then reached such proportions as it became possible by taxation and by the sale of government securities to raise the sums which could never have been raised when the rearmament programme accelerated Acceleration began in 1935. So, in plain speaking, the the MIFO bill, as it stresses there, was a way of keeping rearmament secret because um, the Metallurgische 
portion Geschelschaft, um, a uh, innocuous sounding uh, metallurgical um, uh, enterprise, uh, was in was ultimately a kind of like a finance house for rearmament. Any um, weapons inspectors or foreign observers. Um, making sure that Germany was adhering to the Treaty of Versailles, would look at MIFO bills and believe that they were there to finance something entirely different, something civilian and industrial. The second point of, uh, is that the, the MIFO bill is essentially a bond. It is a, a kind of a promise to the future. The issuer says that it is worth uh, a certain amount, it can be spent on arms, and that and it is guaranteed by the German government. Uh, the German government will pay um, uh, either in, th- it says, as it says here, in six, uh, six months' time, um, which could be extended by um, th- uh, three months. But in some cases, it ran to over four years. Um, and it was uh, a, 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 an assumption, even though there was an assumption underlying all of this, that the uh, German economy would have grown sufficiently uh, at that point for taxation to repay um, the capital and the interest on the bill. So this was really the regime creating for itself with some kind of imaginary uh, imaginary line of credit uh, in order to rearm and in order to um, conceal this as well. Between 1934 and 1936, the MIFO bills accounted for half of all arms spending. After that, when the economy uh, recovered, um, the armament began to shift uh, from um, MIFO bills uh, to taxation, and um, the need for secrecy had dissipated at that point because Germany's rearmament was known to everybody, and the regime had no interest in uh, hiding or concealing what it was doing. Now, I've said before uh, that Hitler's lack of understanding about uh, economic issues meant that the Nazi uh, economy never fully resolved any of the crises that it faced. Instead, as so often happens, uh, the crisis sort of transforms itself or transmutes itself and re-emerges later down the line. So, between 1933 and 1934, rearmament uh, was threatened by two uh, significant crises, uh, foreign debt and the balance of payments. And the um, issue of foreign debt was uh, significant. Hitler's government was in a good position, um, a better position than any of its um, uh, predecessors, in terms of reparations, as the Weimar government, particularly Heinrich Brüning's government, had done an awful lot to reduce reparations, and by 1932 at the Lausanne Conference, reparations are actually cancelled. But there was still significant debt uh, that Germany owed uh, for having taken out loans to repay um, reparations. So that uh, persisted. And Hitler had a, a great deal of political capital from the German people to um, walk away from Germany's financial liabilities if he so chose. Uh, a large number of uh, other uh, more uh, mundane and mainstream commercial debts were outstanding. Now we go back to uh, Poole again, who now uh, describes uh, Schacht's views on Germany's foreign debt. And he says, After Hitler came to power, and after Schacht returned to the presidency of the Reichsbank, the problem of Germany's long-term and medium-term indebtedness was met by the declaration of a transfer moratorium. By law, starting on the 1st of July 1933, German debtors were compelled to make payments in Reichsmarks instead of the foreign currency in which the debt might have been incurred, normally, for example, US dollars. The law was not applicable to debts for which standstill agreements had been concluded, the Dawes loans, the Young loans, or other foreign loans for which special arrangements were made. It was left to the discretion of the Reichsbank to determine when, if ever, transfer into foreign currency should be made uh, from the funds uh, of the conversion cast 
um, which was the conversion fund for foreign debt. Immediate threats of retaliatory measures by foreign countries brought a partial payment of interest charges in foreign exchange and in uh, script which were told uh, which were sold at a, a substantial discount. However, after the 1st of July 1934, a complete transfer moratorium was put into effect and no more foreign exchange transfers for payment of interest uh, took place as funding bonds were offered to foreign creditors as payment. So um, a uh, government bond was uh, offered in Reichsmarks instead of uh, trans, uh, trans um, conversion of the um, Reichsmark into US dollars or pound sterling or what have you. And this was a way of hanging on, obviously, to foreign currency reserves, which are immensely of uh, strategic and economic value, particularly if, as Hitler was doing, uh, considering uh, uh, waging a war uh, in the future. Now, it goes without saying that there was considerable anger from Germany's creditors. It might have been possible to uh, have uh, altered this policy had the uh, creditors taken a united stand and Germany might have been forced, for example, to divert um, foreign exchange uh, from paying uh, for um, raw materials, um, uh, for uh, rearmament, uh, towards paying off debts. And so it would have had a significant uh, impact on Germany's uh, developing war machine. However, during the 1930s, one of the most exacerbating uh, factors of the Great Depression and one of the most significant impacts of the Great Depression uh, was the decline in economic cooperation, the rise in protectionism, for example, between Europe and America, resulted also in a, a lack of um, cohesive uh, of um, joined up economic policy and kind of, uh, economic security policy to deal with rogue states like Germany. The other major problem, as just mentioned, was Germany's balance of payments issue. Um, Germany has a outflow of currency from uh, from itself to. Uh, creditor nations and to uh, other trading nations who have uh, more attractive goods and services than Germany at the time. Um, during 1933, there was a favourable balance of uh, 667 million Reichsmarks, but the decline in food imports um, was uh, really partly uh, as a result of this. Uh, in um, 1933, um, the press baron Alfred Hugenberg, who became one of Hitler's ministers, had introduced protectionism um, in, into Germany's kind of food economy, and this resulted in this um, balance of payment surplus. However, the following year, in uh, 1934, the balance of payments dipped to uh, a negative of. 284 million Reichsmarks. Now, for those who aren't economists, uh, the, the, the balance of payments really is a measure of, um, of trade. It is a, a measure of how much trade one is doing with the outside world and how um, successfully the outside world is exporting its goods and services to your country. So a, a, a negative balance of payments indicates an outflow of cash from your country to other countries in order to pay for um, imports and it also indicates that your domestic industries aren't really competing very well with your domestic home market and they prefer uh, goods and services from other countries. So it's not a good look. This um, balance of payments was a result of two things. Firstly, the programs of rearmament and work creation involved lots and lots of raw materials which had to be imported. And this in, uh, increases consumer demand, rearmament increases consumer demand because money is pouring into people's pockets. Because your consumer demand is um, going up 
and the raw materials in Germany are being consumed by rearmament, there are lots of nice attractive things in the shops to buy with the new cash burning holes in people's pockets and so they look to products from overseas. Unlike uh, Britain, who uh, devalued and uh, devalued the pound, uh, took it off the gold standard, uh, allowed it to decrease in value, and thus it really ended the Great Depression by about 1934, Germany uh, desperately hung on to uh, a highly valued uh, Reichsmark, partly for kind of reasons of uh, misguided national prestige. Uh, but this led to uh, German exports being too expensive. And uh, as a result, um, the uh, economic crisis that Germany faced kind of uh, limped on. Uh, and it also meant that the balance of payments problem was still was uh, largely unresolvable. In June 1934, gold and foreign exchange reserves in the Rush Bank had fallen so low that they had reached a level of uh, 100 million Reichsmarks, which is next to nothing really. And the government was in a serious danger of, uh, of, of losing all uh, foreign currency reserves altogether. Uh, this meant, then, meant that foreign exchange controls uh, had to be introduced. Um, they'd originally been uh, brought about in August 1931. Um, but the 25th of June, it was decided that the Reichsbank would allocate foreign exchange on a day-to-day -day basis. So if a uh, importer wanted to buy a, a large amount of French wine or American cars uh, and needed to have uh, to access a, a large amount of uh, dollars in, in order to do it, these dollars would be uh, these foreign exchange reserves would be uh, rationed and it would be down to the um, the scrutiny on the the kind of the judgment of Schacht and his ministry um, uh, and the Reichsbank as to whether uh, this kind of currency would be handed out for these sorts of transactions. And so imports and exports become politicised and the the obvious uh, point that was would be made by Reichsbank officials is why can't you find why can't your business uh, either produce a, a local alternative to the thing you're importing or why can't you find somebody else in Germany that makes this thing that you're importing. There were of course a list of uh, priority uh, items that uh, needed to be uh, imported, raw materials um, and the, the kinds of things um, that would only be um, uh, would only be useful to um, rearmament were imported. There was a moment where uh, it looked as if the rearmament program would be threatened, but um, the intervention of the armed forces um, was or, uh, was was there to make sure that rearmament went ahead uh, just as as it should do. And here we see an interesting clash. Um, Economics Minister Kurt Schmidt had a very kind of Keynesian approach to dealing with unemployment and, and um, uh, low consumption. He thought if you grew the purchasing power of the, the masses, obviously by putting money in their pockets, um, you would increase uh, uh, employment, and that would mean that an employment benefit, unemployment payments would decline. And this would, um, in the view of the army, be uh, a nightmare because uh, increased consumer spending would mean that resources would be um, uh, steered away from uh, the rearmaments industry or it would mean a flow of imports and the foreign exchange problem would uh, exacerbate itself. So in some uh, of the uh, generals of the Wehrmacht thought, it is better that the German people learn about hardship and privation because they'll need to be a lot tougher uh, with a lot fewer luxuries for the forthcoming struggle of national survival um, and the, the rerun of the First World War, which um, the Wehrmacht and Hitler were both rather, rather keen on uh, initiating. And the army by Colonel Georg Thomas, 
um, who was the head of the uh, Defence Economy and Weapons Bureau, uh, the Wehrwitzschaft und Waffenwissen, um, uh, which was part of the, uh, the Wehrmacht office. He wrote to, Hit- uh, to Hitler on the 20th of June 1934 um, and said the following things. The Reich Defence Ministry has for years been pointing out the necessity of preparing the economy for the event of war. It has demanded stockpiling and revealed um, the dangers of the loss of foreign exchange and the collapse of exports for the defence of the country and has especially requested the regulation of the peacetime economy in accordance with the needs of war. Only the present Reich government has decided to fulfil these demands, but unfortunately economic developments threaten to nullify these efforts which have hardly begun. The information from industry and reports from the supervisory officials for raw materials show clearly that the raw material situation is becoming daily more acute. Not only does this endanger the government's work programme, but also the basis for an operational commitment of the Wehrmacht is becoming more and more remote, and everywhere the question is being asked, what is the point of a larger army if it lacks supplies? It is lifeblood. The raw material situation is taken far more seriously by the business community than the Reich Economic Ministry, and since everybody is clear about the fact that we are in the middle of an economic war, it is incomprehensible that decisions are not taken to overcome the danger which threatens. For months we have noticed the drain of foreign exchange followed by the melting away of stocks of raw materials, but so far there has been no firm intervention to remove the danger, with a few exceptions which have proved insufficient. What has happened to all the lessons we have learned from the Great War in the economic field? Because of the struggles between capitalist interest groups, the wishes of the party officers, and the misguided interventions and opinions of individuals, no decisions are taken. So this was a kind of a, an appeal to Hitler to uh, act, to intervene, and to make a decision. And we will see in a forthcoming podcast on uh, Yalmar Schacht and Hitler, I'll probably do in a, a week or so, what his actions were. Anyway, I hope you found this useful, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Do swing by our Facebook page, and there's a link to uh, the new Facebook group at the bottom of this uh, podcast. All the best, thanks. Bye-bye.